Serious Sam Next Encounter is a video game for the Nintendo GameCube and PlayStation 2, and oh boy, do I have a lot to say about this one. Well, let's dive into this console exclusive title with a relevant comment. Which console is the better choice for playing this game? We'll talk more in depth about this later, but to move on quicker here, I'll highlight a few key points. While the PlayStation 2 port was released only 10 days later, it didn't do much to enhance the game. As a matter of fact, when you compare the two side by side, the PlayStation 2 port looks just terrible. The lighting effects are mostly missing or buggy, the pixelated render distance makes it rather difficult to play, and the game has an overall PlayStation 1 look to it. On the other hand, the game looks pretty dang sweet and almost beautiful at times on the GameCube. We'll delve further into the graphics later, but first let's take a look into the presentation of the game. This installment starts off with some logos and intros, and then gives you the option to start a new game as one of the many multiplayer characters. Whichever one you choose makes no difference, however, and you can even create your own profile with the character you choose to represent it. When you first start the game, you might notice a few things. First of all, you'll find that the camera options are by default set to inverted. I also found the option for auto-aiming, something present in every Serious Sam game put on a console. I found that if you're good enough with a controller, you won't really need it. It takes up too much space on the screen in my opinion and comes off as a tad too obnoxious for its own good. When you eventually come across a moment where Sam speaks, you might notice a rather awkward mix between sound and vocals. I recommend changing the audio settings to what you see here. That was the best setup I found for properly being able to hear everything just right. Starting a new game initiates an introduction cutscene to tell you about the objective and why you're pursuing it. There's a fun little evil ruler versus evil clone versus you scenario going on and besides that there's practically no story at all. By skipping the cutscenes, you'd probably have a hard time figuring out if a story even exists. I'd greatly prefer if there was a better introduction to this clone character, as his origin and purpose are all but present. Unfortunately, the story does practically nothing with itself or its source material short of a few brief cinematics, which is really a shame. As I touched a bit on earlier, you can skip the cutscenes in this game and choose to just read the Natrixa message board if you're interested in only finding the statistics for your mission. I do like it when the player is given the choice whether he wants to sit and listen or just go guns blazing. Natrixa proves to be a very useful tool here to go more in-depth about the objectives without having a cinematic dedicated to. It. You trigger an element of the game, a mail icon pops up, you press the Z button, and by a legend of color scheme, you can quickly learn more about your enemies, weapons, and locations. Your starter gun for the game is a single deagle pistol, which soon becomes dual pistols once you've started the second level. There's no way to go back to the singular deagle. Not sure why you'd want to, but as soon as you've collected the second one, there's no going back. These pistols provide roughly the same damage outputs as the classics do with the Colt weapons, however they are able to cause a lot more damage in a shorter period of time. Your standard firing speed is nothing special, but you're able to rapid fire these pistols the faster you tap the fire button. This means that you can run through your 12 round magazine quite quickly, then you're left to reload. Considering the amazing user input firing rate of the pistols, you'll likely end up using them quite a bit in the game, so I can't say you'll just forget these pistols once you move on to more powerful weapons. They're still very much useful throughout the entirety of the game. The first weapon in your lineup is your chainsaw, which you actually get after the pistols, but I suppose it was put there as it's the only melee weapon in the game, and bigger enemies can smack you while you're using it, so it might not be smart to use it in that case. I found that larger hordes of weaker enemies can be easy fodder for the chainsaw, and you can use it to preserve ammunition while knocking down hundreds of enemies. I wouldn't suggest using this weapon against the dum-dums, however, as they tend to back away from you the closer you get. What I can't understand is why they introduced the chainsaw just before a giant horde of dum-dums. The one enemy that runs away if you get too close just happens to be the one they spawn alongside the only melee weapon in the game. But in the end, I didn't end up using the chainsaw all too often despite its power. There's a lot of guns to be playing with here, so I only really used it if I needed to. It's a great weapon if you properly analyze where and when to use it. Technically, the second weapons of the game would be the dual Uzis. These are fast-firing machine guns which, while not too powerful on harder difficulties, can eliminate any foe with enough fire. Holding down the trigger for a prolonged period of time puts the guns in a secondary gangster fire position. There's literally no purpose for this whatsoever, but it's for style and there's nothing wrong with that being there. You may also notice when quickly switching to these weapons and immediately firing can manipulate the sound in a kind of strange way. For some reason, if you quickly switch to these weapons and fire, you can trigger the firing sound to play twice overlapping each other. This makes it sound a little over the top and can be prevented by either waiting a moment before firing or just cease firing and start firing once again. These, these are the first weapons you'll come across in the game with alternative ammunition. You can collect ricochet bullets in rare scenarios which do exactly as you'd expect. The ricochet bullets are incapable of harming our hero for whatever reason and can sometimes but rarely hit a target after colliding with a wall. There were a few cases where these bullets came in a bit handy, but these were rare situations. Most times where I'd used them is when I had run out of standard ammunition, and then I couldn't help but feel like when I was using it, I was wasting them as I wasn't using them for their desired purpose. 
The third weapon is the double-barreled shotgun, which brings power and speed to the table. Unlike previous installments, the double-barreled shotgun has an extremely fast firing rate considering the type of weapon it is. Sam reloads the two shells very quickly, and being that this shotgun garners a lot of damage to his enemies, it comes off as an extremely useful weapon. It becomes very handy for killing sometimes up to three enemies in one blast. It holds up to 100 rounds at two shells per fire, and you can run out of this ammunition rather quickly. I'm disappointed that the amount of ammunition for this gun is a bit more scarce than per se the 9mm Uzi slash minigun ammunition. You can find this ammunition all over the place, but finding shells for your double-barreled shotgun wasn't exactly rare, but it didn't come across too often. I'd find myself more often relying on ammo backpacks for this ammunition, and I just wish there was more of it on its own. The fourth weapon is the minigun, which as I had said a moment ago, shares this ammunition with the dual Uzis. Essentially, it fires from the same capacity of the Uzis, and fires a lot faster, though requires a second or two to spin the barrels before the bullets start flying out. This minigun has been nerfed rather significantly from the other titles, and spits out bullets a lot slower than in the classic titles. Even still, it comes in quite handy handy when a large horde of enemies is at bay and you're not sure how to deal with them. It's never a bad decision to pull out the minigun, but it isn't always a particularly good decision either. Being as there's no recoil or splash damage like other weapons in the game, using the minigun is the same as playing it safe in a larger battle. Like the Uzis, you can pick up a secondary ammunition type for the minigun, and these are homing bullets. Homing bullets do exactly as they'd imply. Holding down the trigger in virtually any camera position will fire an ensemble of bullets towards your closest enemy. The only reason I ever found pristine use in these is when I couldn't find an on-screen enemy. The fifth weapon in the game is the rocket launcher, though it's actually listed as the sixth weapon behind the grenade launcher for some reason, despite getting it much earlier. The rocket launcher is the first weapon in the game to utilize three different types of ammunition. Your primary being standard rockets, which fire rather quickly, your secondary being homing rockets, which essentially work the same as the minigun's homing bullets, and your tertiary being sonic rockets, which create a large amount of blast damage upon hitting a target, giving you the ability to knock down larger enemies faster. The rate of fire is a tad slower for the homing rockets and a tad more so for the sonic rockets. If you pay close attention to when firing the rocket launcher, you might more so notice the issue with the spinning barrel. While in the classics, the barrel would instantly swap back to the starting position, in the next encounter you may notice the barrel very quickly moves back into the starting position. I suppose this might be a new engine issue, as it's been speculated that this entry runs on a somewhat superior engine than the classic games. Something I did note which is very admirable and unseen in the classic titles is that when you've got one rocket left, you'll actually see just the one rocket in the barrel and until it's been fired. As per a lot of elements in this game, there's some little details which really add to the charm and build of the game. The sixth weapon listed as the fifth weapon in the game is the grenade launcher. This shoots, as you could guess, grenades. There are two alternative grenade types you can find, which are spider mines and limpet grenades. The spider mines will drop and crawl to the closest enemy it can find, and the limpets will stick to the ground and wait for the prey to run into it. Of course, that's dependent on where you place them, if it will ever reach its prey. The limpet grenades are no more than sticky bombs if you're more used to that terminology. You know, it's pretty funny, the grenade launcher has probably the most unique alternative ammo types in the game, and I don't think I use them at all aside from the lack of ammunition. The issue here is that the primary fire on the grenade launcher is so poor that every time I thought of the grenade launcher, I'd usually just look for more ammunition. There's something about the next encounter as a whole which has this really strange deal with gravity. What comes up must come down really, really fast. In the classic titles, the grenade launcher was able to reach quite the distance with a fully charged shot, unlike in the next encounter, whereas a lot of entities in this game, it very quickly arcs towards the ground. It's funny that, because the model and animation of this grenade launcher looks a lot more powerful than the standard Mark III grenade launcher we're familiar with. You can see the springs and the impact when firing, and yet it doesn't result in much of a distance. It's a shame, but for the gravity in this game alone, the grenade launcher falls inferior to pretty much every weapon in the game. The seventh weapon in the game is the gas gun, which is pretty useful when the coming gets a bit too close. Lighting your enemies aflame puts a dark overlay on their texture to imply the impact caused by the weapon. Flames will appear on your enemies, and this will continue to burn through their flesh until the flame burns out, at which point the enemy may have already fallen victim to it. If you've damaged an enemy before firing the flames, you'll probably notice the dark texture on your enemy sets to the same damage output you've inflicted, making it seem as if you've been using the gas gun on them from the start. You'll also get access to two alternative firing modes such as liquid nitrogen and laughing gas. Both types are quite rare in the game, especially the laughing gas. Liquid nitrogen freezes your enemies into ice, which you can then shoot with any other weapon and send them to their frozen doom encased in tiny icicles. It also slows down the enemies so it can be extremely useful on beheaded kamikazes. It's even more useful knowing that explosive attacks from the enemies won't work against you anymore once they've been frozen, so a kamikaze blowing up in your face won't inflict any damage if you've used your liquid nitrogen to freeze them. The laughing gas, well, makes your enemies laugh. You can use this gas against every enemy type in the game, and they all have a unique animation once you've shot it at them. There are a lot of enemies in this game which you'd never be able to set the laughing gas on throughout the game as the ammunition wasn't present during specific levels where they'd take place. If you unlock cheats for the game, 
you can go back to these levels with all the weapons and ammunition, and sure enough, the animations are all present. It's just another element of this game where a lot of detail was put in which I believe has gone rather unnoticed. I'd only noticed the laughing gas's existence after playing through the game maybe three or so times. The laughing gas does damage to the enemy, and essentially the enemy will die of endless laughter. We love to laugh, sure, but that sounds like a very painful destiny of misery and sadness. How ironic. And terrifying. The eighth weapon in the game is the sniper rifle, which as in the classic titles, does little damage no scoped and high damage scoped. In fact, when scoped, the rifle provides the most damage output possible in the game besides the serious bomb. A nice little graphical effect is shown on the scope when you're not firing or zoomed in, showing an area of the playing field at all times. Unfortunately, the graphic shows an area it's had left of the crosshair, so it's fairly inaccurate, but it's still some nice little bit of visual flair. When zooming in, the sniper rifle will tell you how far of a distance your target is, up to 200 meters, being able to zoom in 12 times the standard distance. Your range is much greater than 200 meters, however, so there's no need to worry about that. If you zoom out just after firing, you won't see the recoil animation you'd see when shooting without the scope. Considering this is how you should always be firing the weapon, it's bizarre to see nothing happen upon the transition. There's a bug with this rifle where you can fire it a lot faster upon swapping weapons to and fro very quickly. Fire, swap, swap back, fire. Of course, this isn't zoomed in, so it would create a lot less of a damage output, but you can technically do this even with the zoom, you just gotta be very fast to pull that off. The bullets you fire from the rifle will also create a graphical speed effect to give the feeling of the bullet traveling incredibly fast through the air. It's still strange to me after all these years that a scoped sniper shot is more powerful than the cannon, but considering how much fun it is to use the sniper rifle against loads of enemies at once, I never really cared. So as I briefly mentioned, you can penetrate enemies with the sniper being able to shoot a maximum of up to four enemies, wounding the fifth. I tried this on the weakest enemies of the game, so this is indeed confirmed. At least for the hard difficulty, which is what I was playing on. The ninth weapon in the game is the cannon, listed as the tenth weapon in the game. It has a similar feel to the grenade launcher, though this time being more useful. It still has the arc which the grenade launcher had on its projectiles, but the damage output is significantly larger, can penetrate enemies, and is great for one-shotting some of the more powerful enemies. Though, unlike in the classic installments, certain enemies will take more than one hit of the cannon. This means that you won't knock down a Biomech Major or an Eludrin Reptilioid in one hit, no, I'd recommend a blast from the double-barreled shotgun just afterwards. Aside from the arc and damage difference, it's precisely the same cannon we all know and love with a slightly altered view model. I was rather confused by its inability to jib smaller, weaker enemies. If anything, this further emphasizes the possibility of this game being made in a different engine than the classic SAM titles. The tenth weapon in the game is the Syrian Power Gun, a gun used by the alien race of Syrians, which is currently under experimental uses by the human military. Most of the weapon's attributes are considered unknown by the Nintrixa message board, and claims the range is often further than the human eye can see. This doesn't seem to be far-fetched, as I'm always able to hit a target no matter the distance with this gun. My guess is by attributes of the game, the range is practically distanceless. So as you may have been able to guess, this is a replacement of sorts for the laser gun in the classic games. This game also takes a more similar use to the scrapped Ghostbuster weapon from the Serious Sam Alpha. It shoots a stream of laser energy which can be used to quickly vanquish foes. It's super powerful, super useful, and super big on the screen. When firing this, you might not be able to see what's in front of you. Part of me thinks that this was a decision to compensate with its overwhelming power. This is the only weapon in the game with a secondary firing mode exclusive to the weapon itself and not by specific ammunition pickups in the game. That means you can refill this ammunition with its standard ammo pickup and from the ammunition backpack. Ooh, 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 a new toy! Unlike the secondary ammunition for the rest of the weapons, which you'll have to find on your own. You're able to charge up a blast shot which provides a large amount of splash damage, killing loads of smaller enemies in big hordes. Charging this starts with an aesthetically pleasing animation, which creates a tiny energy ball that collects ammo over time and becomes stronger. After a period of time, or when you let go of the trigger, your shot will fire. The circumstance of this large blast radius is the fact that you can often get harmed by your own shot. Make sure you're a good distance away from a horde of enemies when you fire it, as it can cause quite a bit of splash damage to the player if shot too close. And the last weapon of the game is the infamous Serious Bomb, a weapon that decimates all nearby enemies on screen while putting a temporary shield around the user to prevent self-harm. Aside from this being placed extremely awkwardly in the front of the screen, it works exactly the same as the original Xbox port of the game, as well as in Serious Sam HD, the second encounter. It's rare, it's incredibly powerful, it's awesome. Nothing more to say about that one. 
Swapping through the various weapons is a breeze by quickly tapping X or Y to navigate through them, or by holding either button and use the analog stick to tap which weapon you'd want to use. This also pauses the game. The weapon wheel comes in rather handy in quick thinking scenarios, so you might end up using it rather often. It's always good to see an alternative way to swap weapons in a game that utilizes so many of them. Now that we've covered the weapons, I'd like to delve further into the enemies of this game, their properties, and how they affect the gameplay. Enough of the bull already. So you've got your wearables, reptilioids, biomechs, but something looks a tad different here. Not everything granted, but a good number of things. These wearables look different, the biomechs look a tad similar to an uncommon beta screenshot I found, these reptilioids, well, actually they look pretty- look different! You'll probably notice a lot of design changes in the next encounter, and I'm left to assume these changes of style are entirely relevant to the difference of developers. This game, unlike every other Serious Sam title, was not made by Crow Team. No, as a matter of fact, this and Serious Sam Advance, if you can really call that an entry in the series, were made by Climax, a studio that made numerous different genres of titles. They're rather inactive nowadays, but they do appear to have some involvements here and there. So it seems that they wanted to provide a different style for the next encounter. As with all the other details I've mentioned, this is something I can really appreciate. The design choices, while perhaps a bit dated in graphical fidelity, are visually delightful. The bright saturation of the biomix vivid colors and the giant pointy horns put on a new wearable model are greatly appreciated, but you won't believe what they did to the NAR. The, uh, the NAR. The... the NAR. Wait, where are the NARs? Oh wait, there's one! Uh, well kind of. For whatever reason, Climax didn't include the NAR enemy in this game, a rather staple creature in the series. There's two cameos as far as I know, one NAR being far off into the distance as a secret, being roasted by a bunch of dib dib dum dums, and in one of the final cutscenes of the game where one takes Sam away in a taxi. These uber drivers are getting weirder and weirder. Seemingly the NAR has been replaced with a new enemy character called the Dum Dum. This is a two-legged green ball-shaped alien who waddles along on two webbed feet towards Sam, hoping to munch away. This is probably one of the greatest creatures I've ever seen. While I'll admit they don't do much for the game in particular, you can't help but look at this thing and think, you know what? I like him. Maybe it's a whole Mike Wazowski thing going on, but no matter the role, I will always be totally okay with a Dum Dum in a video game. Something I notice is that when a Dum Dum spawns, you hear the beheaded soldier sight sound. Which is odd, because if a Dum Dum spots you after being idle for a period of time, they have their own sight sound. No other enemies spawn with the beheaded soldier sight sound, so whatever the case, I can't explain. But in summary, the Dum Dums serve virtually the same role as the Nars did in the classic games, being tiny nuisances that run towards you trying to cause some damage while other enemies fire away at you. I guess maybe they felt the Nar was a bit of an uninspired enemy, and it's not like I don't agree with that. The Dum Dum style fits a lot better here, and the Nar being such a trademark character in the game series, I can understand why they would give them some sort of cameo. The Nars exist in this game, they just aren't at mental's disposal here, if there's anything to tie this to lore. A lot of other enemies saw similar changes, being reskins of sorts from the classic games. The Porcine Berserker is clearly a Cucurbito. The Witch Harpy is clearly a, uh, Witch Harpy. Then they do other things you wouldn't expect. The Dum Dums which replace Nars are eventually replaced by Monkey Zombies in the Feudal China chapters of the game. Enemies get replaced here and there, making it almost feel as if there was an overwhelming number of ideas stockpiled into one big package. The number of enemies which make an appearance in this game is crazy. I understand that Serious Sam 2 actually has more enemies than this, but at least in that game they made use of just about each one properly. In Serious Sam Next Encounter, there are several enemy types you might come across only once in the entire campaign, which is quite bizarre. In a game such as this where enemies are a dime a dozen, what's the point in spending a long period of hard work on modeling, texturing, and animating a creature that only shows up once for a short period of time and doesn't contribute much to the game at all? My only thought is that there were a lot of ideas and little formation on where and when these ideas would take place. There's a lot of properties in the game which can both enhance and detract from the experience. I spoke earlier in the weapon analysis about the Dum Dum's ability to back away from the player if he gets too close in order to allow the player to move freely through crowds and not to get stuck between them. This is smart, and I think it's a good move on their part. However, this seems to be the only case where this idea is present. Other enemies, particularly the clear skeletons, will bombard you in large numbers, and they won't budge. Very many deaths have fallen victim to being stuck between a large crowd of clear skeletons to the point that is pretty much a fault. Clear skeletons also have the tendency to spawn all around you, crowding you in a circle. This will pretty much hand you your death warrant each time, and it really does feel unfair. In the classic Serious Sam games, pretty much every death you could blame on yourself. Even hitscan enemies like the arachnoids were somewhat justified. The first game introduced these enemies greatly as well, being in smaller numbers with a few weaker enemies alongside. Outnumbering and disabling you? Not exactly my definition of fair. Of course, this is the case with a lot more enemies than just the clear skeletons, but they provided the most frequent of these failures. If this sounds irritating to you, I wouldn't be surprised, but 
but unfortunately it gets worse. Very frequently enemies will spawn without indicating so with any sort of noise. While a noise is intended to be played for each appearance, unfortunately in a lot of scenarios this isn't the case. I found Witch Harpies to be the most prime example of this, and let me tell you, when you're low on health and strafing around to avoid some ungodly beast, you do not want to be halted in your tracks from a Witch Harpy hovering up from behind you. Because this game doesn't work under the same principles as the classic and preceding titles in the series. There's a point system which proves to be highly important in this game, and I have a lot to say about it. However, there's still more to speak of on the idea of the enemies before we get to that. A lot of my issues with the enemies in this game surround their properties, specifically three come to mind. As is a standard in serious Sam games, shooting a kamikaze will halt it in its tracks, giving the player a moment to get some space from it in order to shoot it without blast damage. Serious Sam Next Encounter doesn't have this property, which means once a kamikaze has come close to you, that's it. There's no way around it, and no chance I won't be taking any damage from him. Practically every enemy in the game has a wound animation, which further leads my curiosity to why the kamikaze was left without one. Even the other beheaded soldiers have this property, when in their case it doesn't even contribute to the game very much. And while I'm on the topic of the beheaded soldiers, I might as well point out that in relation to every other game they've appeared in, the color scheme is wrong. In this game, the red beheaded soldier is called the Syrian Beheaded Rocketeer, and fires one magic missile at the player. The purple beheaded soldier is called the Syrian Beheaded Firecracker, who fires five magic missiles in an arc. Again, unsimilar to the classics, these missiles do not fire from the ground level and shoot at you from the same height as the user. That I don't have a problem with, what I do have a problem with is them swapping the same formula we've been used to for virtually no reason. The firecracker is supposed to be red and the rocketeer is supposed to be purple. On the closure of beheaded soldiers, there was one more thing I wanted to comment on, which was the suspended idle animation which can show on the kamikazes on rare occasions. Specifically though, in the deep city towards the end of the level, the kamikazes can be seen pausing in the idle stance for a good couple seconds. Every time I played this level, the same thing happened. Happens. I don't know why. Then there's the Legionarians in the Ancient Rome chapters of the game. There's another property here I don't understand. This is more than likely a bug, well, I mean, yes, it's a bug, but it's what happens to this bug when you shoot a rocket at it. Typically this ant bleeds a tinted shade of green, though when you fire a rocket at one, red gore. Yeah. Now you might be thinking, well, when the character is jib, they forgot to put the jib property, so it defaults to red. Well, it's not quite that simple. If you get into a combo spree, you jib every enemy you kill. Killing a legionnaire ant doesn't show any jibs at all. Compare this to the Eludrin Reptilio I do spills an incredibly small number of guts which look exactly like a dum-dums. Yeah, this just looks weird. More on the Eludrin Reptilioid, he actually uses the same animation present in an early version of Sirius Sam the First Encounter, as seen in this trailer. Well, actually maybe not, it's either inspired by or a complete coincidence as all animations were recreated for this game. If you're looking for more reference from the older titles, you've also got the Devil Stallion who's no more than an enhanced Dragon Man from the Alpha. And then there's the Atlantean who similarly works like an enhanced Fish Man. There's also evidence of a wasp enemy of sorts, as seen in a promotional artwork picture found in the final unlockable gallery level. You can also spot some sort of mechanical clear in the picture. Whether that's a stylistic choice for the picture or plan for the game is unknown. Now getting back to properties of the enemies which actually matter in the long run, let's take a look at the biomechs again. Upon hunting down your first one, you might realize if you played the other games here that there's no final blow to the player. Both biomechs minor and major are known to shoot one rocket or laser after their death, sort of an involuntary nerve spasm of sorts, as a final attempt to rid of our hero. As per the minor biomechanoids, they actually have another property unseen in the previous games, which is near spot on accuracy. Lasers in the classic game would fly at one predetermined rate. This rate is much faster in the next encounter and can take a huge blow to Sam if you're not careful strafing away from them. Illusion reptilioids aren't the biggest threat in the game, their projectiles don't really home on the player like they used to. Now, that probably makes them sound pretty defenseless. Well, they make up for their uselessness in walking speed. Who boy, these things are fast. Truth be told, however, it's pretty easy to dodge their smack attacks, which again makes them not too huge of a threat. Illusion Reptilioid Highlanders, though, oh man, did they make these guys aggravating. Shared with the Phoenix Bomber, which you only see a few times, the Illusion Reptilioid Highlander shoots a giant orange fireball, which not only creates a massive blast radius, but also causes a lot of damage. This damage output won't just harm you, either. It's usually capable of taking out every enemy in your area. So you might be thinking, well, they don't home in on you so much as they used to, and well, that's where their walking speed really causes a significant problem here. At a long distance, the Highlander provides a mediocre threat, but they won't be at a long distance for very long if they're able to physically make their way over to you. They'll storm right up to you and throw another fireball which can quite often kill you at point blank. Highlanders aren't easy to kill, they take a heavy amount of firepower to take down and ultimately the Highlander becomes one of, if not the most overpowered and highly advantaged enemies in the game. When you see one of these, you better have a damn good escape route. There's a particular enemy in this game that you really only see twice who, like the Highlander, is undeniably overpowered. This is the Elephant Gunner. I quite like the design of this creature, but holy damn am I glad they aren't common. These guys shoot cannons from their trunks which are almost always a one-hit kill. 
You could negotiate the idea of strafing, but the one time you come across them in the standard campaign puts you in a long corridor with almost no space. Enjoy strafing side by side while cannons are being shot down a tight corridor in multiple directions. Yeah, you'll die a few times. We talked a bit about that Devil Stallion earlier, but there's something about this character you'll need to pay close attention to. When the Stallion begins to shoot its fire towards you, whether in a stream or by a fireball with a decent blast radius. Fire in this game is a deadly curse. Anything which has the ability to set Sam on fire is instantly something you'll want to see less and less of because fire damage to Sam is like a 1000 degree hot knife against butter. Watch your health drain in an instant by taking just one hit from a fire type enemy. Do yourselves a favor kitties, don't play with fire. Unless of course that fire is in a flamethrower. Wait, how come this doesn't do as much damage as it does to me? The last enemy I want to individually speak of is the Gandhi Sorcerer. Funnily enough, he didn't have a page on the Serious Sam Wikia, so I went along and made one myself. Guess it goes to show how forgettable of an enemy he was. This bastard shoots magical spells towards you, which inflict a rather large amount of damage towards you. It's best to use a sniper rifle against these creatures. They tended to hover in one spot for a prolonged period of time, so it was easy to get a few penetration kills with the guy being stationary in the background. I think these guys overall provided a bit too much damage to the player, but I've wondered myself at the fact that some incredibly tough enemies here and there up the gameplay variety, as I really do panic the moment I spot one. Overpowered and tough is different, so I think these enemies are relatively safe for the gameplay, but specifically the Highlander and the Octochops needed some sort of nerfing. Those are two enemies that undoubtedly go a lot faster than they should in reference to the surrounding gameplay, and boy do they cause a lot of damage. Now we can finally talk about individual issues that aren't based around a singular type of enemy. There are two issues with the enemy properties in this game as a whole. If an enemy doesn't notice you for a specific period of time, they spawn out of existence, or well, they die and you don't get points for them. This is honestly very helpful on a technical level because too many enemies on screen at once in idle areas can cause a game to lag quite a bit. So it does make a lot of sense why they'd choose to do this. The issue with this is that there's a lot of areas that have bending paths or stairways which can block the enemy's view of the player. This doesn't really affect the gameplay in a major way, it's just something that isn't always at the user's control when it really should be. It seems that gravity manipulation takes a rather big toll on the enemy's ability to track the player so well as this can lead to more unintended enemy despawns. Now secondly, there's the issue of enemies killing other enemies. Sounds like a great concept at first, but when you tie this into the combo system of the game it can become a real nuisance given that some enemies can give you a whopping number of points and you might have been so close to giving them their final blow. Then another enemy on screen will shoot in the same direction and of course by accident give you no points at all for your effort. This can dramatically affect the preset score you'll need to unlock a golden medal at the end of the level, and ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to start talking about the combo system. An awful lot of people criticize the combo system in this game for being tacked on, ludicrous, and generally only relevant to expand the replayability or artificial length of the game. That's where I say, wrong. You see, Serious Sam Next Encounter isn't your typical Serious Sam game. It's a run and gunner, but more in the literal sense. By racking up combos quickly, you're effectively going to continuously be trying to find ways to keep that score going up, and that's essentially the core of the gameplay. It's the same sort of effect you see in games like Sonic the Hedgehog. You're trying to get to that goal as fast as possible because well, that's the purpose. Of course, it's also the way the gameplay is presented. Levels are designed in such a way to give the player a much bigger advantage by going fast rather than slow. The same sort of formula exists in Serious Sam Next Encounter, as the levels are set up for fast demolition and progression. You might be able to notice a rather significant difference between this game and the classics and their level design. Whereas the classic Serious Sam games often involved you turning many corners and then moving your way down some corridor, in Serious Sam Next Encounter, virtually every moment is a potential battle. Infrequently, does the game have you fighting enemies in close quarters, and to be honest with you, when the game does try this, it's rather underwhelming. At its core, the gameplay works around this. Proceed to the next location, fight a large number of enemies in smaller quantities, often from one wave of two to five different enemies, moving its way up to more powerful enemies. The game cools down and throws some weak resistance at you in similar quarters. Then when you don't expect it, a rather large threat comes out of nowhere and puts you to the challenge. But usually this is due to a combo you've been keeping up with, which leads up to this kill being a giant boost to your number of points. Now this is where it gets down to the point. 
Serious Sam Next Encounter fits in the same genre of the other games, but the style is completely different. You may have heard of Ubisoft's early attempt to cash in on this genre of horde-based first-person action titled Will Rock, and it could surprise you that in concept, Will Rock and Serious Sam Next Encounter really aren't that different. A lot of people will say, however, that they didn't find this game all too fun and it was rather forgettable. Only a few enemies you could link to vulnerabilities by specific weapons, and as the game went on, it became more of simply a cluster of different enemies to the point where they weren't all that notable on their own anymore. The combo system in the next encounter is what brings this game to life. It's what keeps the experience engaging during some of the lesser intensive partitions of the game. If Painkiller or Will Rock had something similar to this combo system, I guarantee a lot more people would be willing to sit through it. With a game like Serious Sam Next Encounter utilizing a very satisfying hue of color, saturation, and overall goofiness, it's hard to stay away if even for just how borderline ridiculous it can be at times. Now the enemies in this game are really creative, a masterpiece of design, of course in regards of its own aesthetic, but the game doesn't do anything really special with them. Like I've said in older Serious Sam reviews, the enemies are a key factor in what makes Serious Sam so memorable. The issue with the next encounter to this regard is just how little these enemies made an individual presence. If you've never played a Serious Sam game before, and this is the first one you pick, I can only think of a few characters you'll likely remember when it's done. Those would be clear skeletons, kamikazes, biomechs, and werebulls. Those are all enemies from previous games, and if this is a connection, they're the most common enemies you'll come across. I seriously can't think of a single level where each of those enemies were not present. I mean aside from the geothermal tunnels, but we'll get back to that level later. Now the reason I've said all that here rather than earlier is because this boils down yet again to the Painkiller Will Rock scenario. Enemies are quite forgettable in Painkiller and Will Rock. Unfortunately, this same flaw is present in the next encounter as I just discussed. This again brings me to why Serious Sam Next Encounter held my attention better, which brings me back again to the combo system. Next Encounter's combo mode can result in medals which unlock more levels, we've still yet to talk about just exactly how this system works. Killing an enemy starts your combo, the next kill will bring the combo to times 2 which is when the text first shows on the top half of your screen. To be able to succeed in a combo, there must be less than a 5 second gap between them. This continues to go up until you've reached 20 kills which activates a super combo killing spree. This will enhance your movement speed to the point where you can even outrun a kamikaze. The killing spree lasts 15 seconds and gives you twice the amount of points for every kill executed within that period of time. During this time, a rather intense theme begins to play and a warning bleep will warn you when you've got 5 seconds left in the spree. Filling the combo to 20 kills also gives you 5,000 points upon initiating the killing spree. Should you not fill up the combo, you'll get 250 points for each kill you manage to combo under 20. Now what makes this as hectic and fun as it is, is the fact that the death results in a negative 5,000 point penalty. This not only reduces 5,000 points from your score, but also retracts all points you've gained since the last in-game checkpoint. Had this not been considered, the combo system would be potentially broken, as you could simply fight specific battles in which you'd score more than 5,000 to essentially keep dying, gaining more points, losing 5,000 of those points to then go back into battle with the extra points you scored above 5,000 before death. I think that sounds more confusing than it actually is, right? Point of the matter is they considered that, and you can't do that, which is good. You might also wonder, what if I finish a level mid-combo spree? Do I get to keep the points I've already earned? And yes, you do. Upon finishing a level during a combo spree, the current points you've stacked up go right into the final score. The only thing that can give you points in this game are money bags, which are typically found in secret areas, and of course by killing enemies. Now you've heard about the weapons in this game, and you know what they're capable of. For instance, some particular weapons which utilize the ability to penetrate enemies to cause damage to another enemy behind it. Now the question is, if I were to kill more than one enemy at once with a combo meter at times 19, do I get the combo spree points for every additional enemy killed by penetrated bullets on the 19th combo kill? The answer to that is no. These kills do not count towards the super combo killing spree. If you'd like to hear my ultimate tip for getting high combo scores in the killing spree, you just have to follow this simple instruction. Granted, this only applies in certain levels, but you can apply this to basically any enemy worth a large number of points. Kill the enemies with the lowest point score first, make your way up to tougher enemies. Attempt to find the Ludron Reptilioid Highlander. Once you've reached a killing spree, focus all your powerful weaponry on the Highlander. Even if you kill just the Highlander during the killing spree, you'll likely end up getting more points than you would have gotten otherwise. As a matter of fact, if you only kill just one Highlander in the killing spree, the combo points will add up on screen for a total of 15 seconds. That's literally as long as the killing spree initiates. For. The longest I've ever had this go for was 30 seconds. That's a pretty long time to hear this ding a ling a ling over and over again. It would have been nice to be able to press a button and just finalize the combo. That would also solve another issue. When your points are gathering up, you'll still be getting kills towards activating the next combo spree. As I mentioned before, these combos will give you a maximum of 5,000 points. The gathering points will prevent the next killing spree from initiating until these points have finished accumulating. That in itself is a big problem, because this means if the kills you've accumulated since the ending of the combo spree passes 20, you won't be getting extra points for them in your next combo. You also won't be getting over 5,000 points during this period, so you're stuck getting one time 
times the number of points for the period between points counted and 20 kills achieved. Admittedly, this doesn't happen too often, and if your points have really gotten to the point where it takes such a lengthy time to finish counting, that usually means that you're on your way to getting a gold medal anyways. Of course, this is still a concern, and for those aiming for a high score, well, this can be a serious technical issue. Enhancing the issue is the fact that you can't check your progress towards a gold medal at any point in the level. You're left to finish the level in order to figure out what you've got. It's a nuisance at times because there might be a certain level you keep trying to get gold on, but it's not so fun to just keep playing through the whole level over and over again. As I briefed on before, unlocking these gold medals will give you access to new levels. After you've unlocked them all, you can continue to get the remaining few to unlock some hidden cheats for the game. You can then do things like use newer weapons in older levels. You might then think, oh hey, to get some of the remaining medals, why don't I just spam the serious bomb? Well, while I can commend you on your creativity, this weapon has been timed to perfectly miss that opportunity to link combos together. What that means is don't expect to fill that combo meter unless you've got 20 or more enemies firing away at you. Another weapon which doesn't correspond with combos too well is the pistols. Now, if it weren't for reloading alone, they'd be an insanely epic duo of combo proportions. However, the reloading can often prevent you from continuing your combo. You've got to be very very careful of the remaining clip sizes with these bad boys. If you forget to fire that extra shot and one pistol reloads, you'll have one more shot before you're able to reload again, and by this time you may have already wasted your combo. Be careful with your combos, boys. Now as I've said a hundred times, play Serious Sam on hard mode. This is almost essential in this game since running through the game on normal mode can quite often be difficult to achieve a gold medal in. You'll have to rack up those combos quickly or enjoy your silver or bronze medals, which all in all do nothing for you. If you're gonna play on normal, fine, it's still an option, but never would I recommend and easy mode. You might not even notice the existence of all the bonus content without playing on normal or higher, because all you'll see is the prompt at the end of each level saying medals are not awarded on the easy difficulty. Medals? What's the point exactly? Is what you'll say if you play it through on the easy difficulty. You won't notice bonus content in split screen mode either, which I think honestly wouldn't have been too hard to implement. Just double the gold medal achievement by 1.5, make it harder in split screen to get the medals, but at least still make it possible. Some people play these games for the sole purpose of co-op. You might as well hand them over the whole experience. I know creating multiple enemy spawns for cooperative can be a rather big chore, so as I mentioned, don't even bother and rely on the more chaotic gameplay to get those combos up higher. Hell, you could even just come up with a side motivation, maybe make it more competitive. The player with the more combos gets more alternative ammunition, supplies for the next level or something. There are ways to balance this, and I can't imagine it would have taken that long to do. Of course, you could take some of those abilities away for split screen and the easy difficulty, but even still, that doesn't excuse the inability to inform you that bonus content is actually something which exists in this game. That's about all I have to say about the combo system in this game, unless you want me to mention how the on-screen graphic can flicker sometimes. That's a glitch, right? I, I mean, it seems like it, yet it flickers in such defined segments. Was this a bug or was this intended for some reason? It doesn't happen often, but often enough. Seriously, does anybody know? But now it's time to delve further into the guts of this game, which starts with the level design. As I've mentioned before, the Ancient Rome chapter of the game isn't that exhilarating. Sure, it has its ups and downs, but for the most part, the level design is rather bland. A lot of it consists of very linear progression and small battles. You could say it's just introducing you to the game and its mechanics, which I guess is fair, until you realize just how many damn levels there are for this chapter. The levels themselves never felt unfair, however, as the balance between both enemies and ammunition is quite stable. It's possible that because these locations are heavily based on real-world locations, they didn't have much room for expansion on their designs. The true question the question is, why bother making levels off real-world locations that don't translate to good level design for a serious SAM game? The objectives for this chapter are usually rather clear, emphasized by the yellow checkmark which will typically display over where you have to go next, according to the game being part of Nitrixa's implemented visual overlay. This also comes to use when seeing a door you can't go through just yet with a giant yellow X through it. This is what the game refers to as a lockdown. This consists throughout the entirety of the game. I'm certain there's enough good in the Ancient Rome chapters to condense it to one satisfying chapter, and it makes me wonder why some of these levels weren't just scrapped. When you reach Feudal China, I'll admit it starts off a tad predictable to what you've been used to through the earlier levels of the game, but it quickly gets better. There's some questionable decisions, of course, like this unreachable health previously taking the form of a giant arrow in the sky, but this chapter overall has a more finished and presentable tone to it, especially for a serious Sam title. The landscapes only seem to get larger without hundreds of obstacles in your path. Now I've said in older serious Sam games that giving an area life is essential to the gameplay, but two factors in the next encounter make these open areas acceptable. One, the locations mixed with the open environments 
make sense, and visually the pretty and unique textures are enough to keep you interested. Two, the enemy placement is usually smart, and you often aren't left with long treks of doing nothing. Even during these moments, the game will provide you with one of the three power-ups in the game, Serious Skates. The other two power-ups are Serious Damage and Invulnerability. Serious Damage seriously amplifies the damage given upon your enemies, allowing you to use weaker weapons effectively on stronger foes. Invulnerability allows you to take no damage for a period of time. This power-up is also briefly activated after each death, allowing you to not take any instant damage upon respawning. I do question the point of this, however, as once you respawn, you're put at the last checkpoint, which is really a safe zone as no enemies will be spawned at this point. It makes sense in split-screen co-op, but not really here. After you've traversed Feudal China, you're taken to Legendary Atlantis, which is essentially a giant playground of experimental level design. I really do love to see these types of maps implemented into gameplay. Creative landscapes and manipulation of the environment is a very visually intriguing thing to see. Not only that, but each battle feels a lot more satisfying and intense in the Legendary Atlantis chapter, utilizing a lot more stronger enemy spawns and, well, a lot more enemy spawns in general. To top that off, a lot of these levels consist of open environments with lots of space to fight hordes of enemies in. There are some great designs in this chapter which can ultimately wow you. Other designs, not so much. But the balance between good and bad in this chapter certainly ranges more than the good. What you might be confused of is how Atlantis in this game doesn't appear to be in an underwater city. According to this game, Atlantis is located underground, consisting of various frosty islands and structures. It ties to the theme quite nicely, albeit a bit contradictory. I don't comprehend how in a few of the levels you're able to see a view of space. If Atlantis was this exposed to the overgrounds, we'd certainly have spotted it by now. While I'm talking about the Atlantis levels, I might as well finally speak on the geothermal tunnels level, the only level in the game which you pilot the sub. It's a secret level, and the sub controls relatively well I suppose, but the level itself is pretty broken. You've got different variants of the Atlantis enemies for the underwater segments, which is a really nice touch, and again shows the added detail they put into this game. Unfortunately, in this level you'll come across stuck, unreachable enemies who never despawn, checkpoints that spawn you past an enemy you need to kill, and quite often the inability to continue past a locked door. You'll eventually run out of fuel, which is probably the most common case for finishing this level. But shouldn't this kill Sam? Sam runs out of fuel in his submarine and suddenly ends up at his destination? I think they either didn't have enough time to make this dedicated sub animation, or didn't think it was worth the payoff. In the session I recorded, I kept hearing an idle sound for the killer Mari, who was nowhere to be seen, and I could only assume it got knocked out of the map somehow, or left behind a place I was no longer able to access. My homing rockets, which were one of the two optional weapons for the sub, wouldn't home in on anything, and I was left to just explore the ocean floor until the sub gave out. As per a good few levels in the game, falling off vital platforms is another pain you could run into. At some points you're given the ability to leap right into a place much further back in the map, whereas you'll have to trek all the way back to where you were. It can sometimes take you up to 5 minutes due to how massive the maps are. Have I mentioned that yet, how massive the maps are? It's really impressive, especially considering using your sniper rifle, you can essentially look at the entirety of the map at once, and seeing these platforms a great distance away, which you will end up on without a loading screen, is really, really cool. If only they had a way to prevent leaping off of platforms, though. Seriously, do try your best to stay on track, or you'll really regret it. Though the legendary Atlantis chapter doesn't take place underground, it does have a heavy reliance on water, as the locations typically take place on islands, and the continual imagery of mermen and fishmen livens up the atmosphere. Towards the end of the game, things get really really hard, and I mean astronomically hard. There's two specific waves of enemies in the last two levels which took me an incredible number of tries to beat. Wouldn't you know it, they consisted of Highlanders and Octochops. Seriously, these devils are fast and can quite often make the game feel cheap. One of the waves threw dozens of Octochops at the player which do so much damage at a fast rate, while in another wave they throw around 10 Highlanders at you. Two waves of incredibly overpowered enemies calls for a long period of frustration and I really wish they balanced a couple of the enemies in this game which really deserved it. Amongst all these chapters there were always a few key problems which would now and then get in the way of the experience. Rarely, but sometimes simulated boundaries could get the player stuck. Few, but some locations utilize very tight platforming, requiring you to tread lightly while firing at airborne enemies, often threading the needle to prevent accidental falloffs. Before I make my way into graphics, sound, and game properties, I'd like to talk a bit about the other two vehicles which make an appearance in this game. The submarine is actually a secret vehicle taking place exclusively in just one level of the game, and the same goes for the combine. Firstly, however, there's the Jeep, which is the only vehicle you'll pilot in the main campaign. The first time you'll get access to the Jeep, there's one thought that may primarily cross your mind, and that would be, how the hell do I control this thing? For some reason, the devs thought the smartest decision would be to give the Jeep the most unheard of control scheme known to the GameCube controller. You'd think me badmouthing it, when in all honesty, when you get the handle of it, it's actually not that bad. The best way I can describe it is that it uses traditional first-person shooter controls. I don't mean first-person car controls, I mean literally first-person shooter controls. 
Up and down on the left analog stick moves your vehicle up and down, while left and right on the right analog stick moves your vehicle side to side. Whereas a typical vehicle's controls are to accelerate, brake, and turn, here you get move forward, backward, and turn. In concept, they're the same thing, but the way it was translated to the controller is just, well, unheard of. It's not bad, really, it's just a strange alternative after being accustomed to traditional vehicle controls for all these years. Once you get over the controls, you'll probably find using the Jeep is fairly easy. It's useful and frankly awesome to get a drift kill with the handbrake by using the L trigger. Then running over enemies is usually a breeze if you're not going after stronger enemies, where the physics can flop the Jeep all over the place. This is usually your own fault, though. You're able to enter and exit the Jeep at your own will with the A button, meaning you can pretty much launch the damn thing going at full speed. The Jeep is equipped with two rocket launchers on each side, allowing you to shoot infinite homing rockets at enemies. This essentially makes the Jeep a pretty powerful weapon at times, and with speed like this, you're practically unstoppable. You are still vulnerable, however, as driving the Jeep over time takes up a predetermined amount of gas, plus enemy fire can decrease the remaining gas. Both gas and durability are shown in one gas meter, so both go hand in hand. I suppose this doesn't make all that much logical sense, but in a gameplay sense, it ends up working quite well. I'm sure the more a jeep takes a beating, the more it wouldn't be able to proceed further anyways. The jeep is only available on a few missions, though you'll be able to spot it across three chapters of the game, as well as in some of the secret levels. Like Earth Defense Force 2017, I wish it would tell you what vehicles you have available on the level select, but you can't ask for everything, I guess. Don't be foolish by leaving your jeep out of reach, however, as if you happen to die with a jeep on screen, there's a good chance you won't find it spawning back with you. In the secret level, The Silk Road, you're given the exclusive one-time use of a vehicle called the Combine. Now this vehicle is pretty cool, you'll be able to run over your enemies with rotating blades of destruction to then automatically spew their guts all over the place from the trash chute. In concept, it really doesn't get much more violent than this. There's new problems when using the Combine, however, first of all being its width. Considering the Syrian wearable is a common enemy type to spot in this level, you'll end up being tossed back and forth like crazy as one runs from one side and another might run into the other. Even with smaller, weaker enemies, this can still be an issue because by cause and effect, a bunch of entities running into a wide entity at moderate speeds even still can rock this boat pretty badly. This frustrates me primarily for one reason. A Jeep might be easy to knock around with a couple good blows, but a Combine? Those things are pretty heavy. I'm sure a bull could knock it around, but small enemies who'd likely be victim to those sharp blades in a second? The fact that they can even touch the vehicle is a confusion in itself. The Combine has no additional weapons aside from its blades, so you'll rely solely on those for the majority of the mission. Getting off and walking on foot is an option, but a highly foolish one. You've got a long, long way to walk if you want to get over to your goal. That, and the enemies don't spawn properly if you do this. Therefore, you could potentially break the level by walking to the end. You've got to admit, the creative design is pretty high. I for one really want to highlight this one kamikaze variant who sincerely gives me the creeps. The tricks refers to them as soldiers who refuse to serve mental, who are then brainwashed and tortured for years until their final release of suffering by suicide. They even mumble a very menacing groan, if you manage to hear it in the first place. We'll talk more about why that is in a couple minutes. <laughs> Some of the interiors and exteriors of buildings in this game look quite pretty, even up close. Serious Sam has always been one of those games where the textures got more crisp as you move towards them rather than backwards where the opposite occurs. That's a particular detail that even developers today lack with their modern games. The visual effects are pretty top-notch for its time, and it can really end up looking beautiful at times. In smaller rooms, the water effects surrounding the interior is truly a sight to be seen. It can appear a tad bizarre in the larger rooms, but all the same, it's quite nice to look at. Of course, the game isn't perfect with its lighting, more so in the properties, however. Shadows on destructible environments remain after you've shot them down, so it appears the environments and shadows are completely different entities. This can demonstrate a bit of laziness per design. There's a few other lazy mishaps here and there with the game, a more notable one being when Sam jumps. If you take a look at the view model, there's a weird bug that props the position a tad to the right. This is just irritating, and it always bugged me, especially as someone who constantly bunny hops in video games. Skyboxes are pretty disappointing at times too. If you pay direct attention to them, they appear to be maybe moderately sized JPEG images set to wrap around the level accordingly. Now don't get me wrong, they're nice skyboxes, sure, but the resolution of them is rather lacking. These circular patterns could have been avoided with a higher quality image, and it can end up making the skyboxes look a tad noticeable at times. Especially considering enemies will spawn in the sky, and then you have to look right up at them. The rest of the mentionable attributes rely more so on the properties of the game. Telefragged. Something like the jibbing of enemies might seem like an easy process to do right, and traditionally it works pretty well in the next encounter. There will be times when you come across an oddity, however. Longer rendering distances do not produce jib staining, so when you finally get around to the location you blew up an enemy at, you'll find nothing but the guts of your victims. No blood in sight. Why hadn't I thought of that? No blood. 
When you're around the blood, however, the explosive effects of the jibbing process can stain the battlegrounds for an awfully long period of time. Sometimes it felt like five minutes had passed and I'd still see those stains around. The same goes for dark explosion stains, and for what you can't make up in the staining, seeing them keep these apparent throughout the game was just another charm added to the experience. Retracting from the game's experience, though, can be the, uh, sometimes pointy jibs? This game can't be procedurally generating gore, right? Someone actually sat down, modeled this jib, and thought it looked presentable. Just think about that. There is some other nonsense, of course, this more significant than the last. If you collect a new item and then immediately pick up something else, you actually won't know what was the last item you picked up unless you paid attention to the floating model before you picked it up. The text informing you of what you got overwrites every previous item, and therefore especially in groupings like this. It's a tedious process if you want to slowly pick up everything just to see what you're actually going to get. It's probably also the reason why I very rarely notice when I've got laughing gas ammo, for the very few times you can actually find it. What sets next encounter even further back is the fact that a lot of secrets are based on the destruction of a specific number of towers or other entities. There's no clue at all informing you of these secrets, and it's really just based on if you want to shoot everything in the map that you can because maybe there will be a secret somewhere. Maybe. These are listed in the game as prohibitional bonuses, and I even recall one level requiring you to shoot every barrel in the map to unlock the several treasures which would spawn upon doing so. This is just a bit too much, and for those completionists that want to find everything, well, there could even be a secret nobody's found to this day. How should I know? They don't list them anywhere. But if there's anything the game properties do significantly better than the other Serious Sam games, it would be the fact that the mini in-game cutscenes do in fact pause all surrounding action. No longer will you have to rely on being in a safe spot when this happens. Okay, so the last point I have on this topic is a pretty important one, and it addresses the targeting ridicule. Sometimes it shows you to be targeting an enemy, and then, well, it isn't. This is where the auto-aim option can come in handy, but I've always felt that enabling it decreases the immersion for the player. The point for me personally is why need auto-aim when you've got a decently sized crosshair? But the crosshair doesn't always work as it should. Check out this sniper shot for example. Apparently this is considered a successful shot. But this isn't somehow? Nah. This is one of the worst things you can encounter in a first person shooter. I mean, it's not superbly common, but it does become a nuisance when it does happen. It's not something that'll have you saying, wow, this game is trash and I will now turn it off and never play it again. But yeah, it's a pretty important oversight. That's probably the biggest problem I have with this game. You'd think this would be an absolute priority in developing the game. <sighs> Moving along. The second last direct topic we have is the sound. Now the soundtrack itself can be great at times. Some of the tracks are very peaceful and relaxing, with an exotic twist. It's a tad bizarre when it turns to repeating guitar riffs and electronic hums though. The ambiance is superb, perhaps the grind segments are a bit over the top. I've downloaded the soundtrack for this game, as I do enjoy it that much, but I've deleted a few of the tracks. The soundtrack is a really mixed bag honestly. It's a mix of beauty and mediocrity. The peaceful tracks blend nicely into the tracks, which is great, but the expected transition to grind style is always abrupt and comes out of seemingly nowhere. There are some particularly weird sounds in a few of the ambient tunes which can give you the feeling that something much greater lurks beneath you, or for that matter just around the corner. Not sure why this feels eerie considering what Sam puts up with on a room to room basis, but what you can't see is always a lot more horrifying. Someone please fun deep sea exploration! On that note, Sam actually has the ability to speak underwater. Maybe you could go down and look for us with a couple rockets and a minigun. I'm having a hell of a time staying dry. Sam truly is an odd character the more I think about it, and hey, we've gone this entire review without talking about Sam's one-liners, have we? Well, of course, John J. Dick continues his role as the sarcastically wonderful serious Sam, and quite honestly, I think he approaches these lines even better than the rest of the series entries. I suppose maybe he had better direction considering he was working with a team of primarily English speakers. His cracks at the enemies are spot on, and the humor he portrays in unique situations is perfectly executed. Dashing through the snow with rockets and grenades. Time to blow some holes in an alien's face. Yeah, I've got some big balls. This whole place is steam powered. Just like me after a plate of beans. And I thought Caesar's Palace was in Vegas. I met my first wife in Vegas. It's a shame what happened to her. Sam will also briefly bring up his several wives who seem to have gone through something terrible. I wonder what happened to Sam's wives, especially the one he met in an alien science laboratory. An alien science laboratory. I met my fourth wife in an alien science laboratory. It's a shame what happened to her. They probably should have put a bit more time into working out the odd musical interruptions during in-game cutscenes. Yeah!
Oh man, super intense pissing dog! Uh, I don't feel like this should be as intense as it really is. I guess before I finish I have to at least address the multiplayer. You got a whole bunch of crazy multiplayer models which are, well, a bit flat. They've got no individual traits of their own to the gameplay and utilize all the same lines from John J. Dick's voicing of Sam, even for the females. It's basically just a different visual to differentiate players, and it's a welcomed addition but could have done with a bit more polish in the statistical area. You can play split screen through the whole campaign with a friend, and play deathmatch with up to four players also in split screen. Cooperative works just as you'd expect, and it's certainly a nice addition to the game. You can have some pretty goofy fun playing this with a friend and that's how it should be done, right? There are three different types of deathmatch available in the game. There's standard deathmatch, hold the flag, and pass the bomb. They're all variants of the kill each other concept and they're all fine and well, but the unusual physics I spoke of earlier are of course still here, so being strategic in your gameplay takes some getting used to. It probably won't be something a newcomer can just pick up and play with you and expect not to get mauled by someone who's played the game through. There's a couple options to tweak the experience, which while nothing special, it does help in creating a more user-defined experience for playing styles. I think these multiplayer modes are a great addition to the game, and in a world that lacks a lot of this couch fun nowadays, I gotta say it's almost inspiring to see. There are six individually unique maps to the game for playing the deathmatch modes in, so it's not a lazy throw together. There was some time put into this, and as I've said, it's nice to have, but the real question is who you'll be playing it with. And wouldn't you know it, we're practically finished with this review. We've talked about the weapons, the enemies, the integral properties, graphics, sound, just about everything I can touch on. So at the end of the day, is Serious Sam Next Encounter a game worth recommending? Enough of the bolo! Already. My final score for Serious Sam Next Encounter is a 7.7 .7 out of 10. Whoa, that's pretty new. I've never done a score that didn't end in a 5 or a 0 before. There's a reason for that. Serious Sam Next Encounter does a lot of things right, and in the end, it turns out to be a very fun, frantic experience, which in reflection was executed a lot better than most games which dare to confront this genre. However, there are a lot of issues with this game, and those have been able to retract from the experience as a whole. The good in this game outweighs the bad quite significantly, and nothing in the game was really game-breaking. Well, aside from the geothermal tunnels, but even then you didn't have to do it and there was always an ending. You might just have to wait a long time for it. So I can't give the game a 7.5 because that feels too low, but I can't give it an 8 either because that feels too high. Therefore, I settled with 7.7. .7. It's a bit weird, but take it or leave it. The game sets itself up for a potential sequel at the end, which unfortunately never came to be. It ends on a bit of a cliffhanger, but considering the game is all in all just a spin-off, I suppose finishing it here could be interpreted more like the end of a children's book. The little boy finally found his honeypot and came back home with it, but he accidentally broke the pot before he could put any of the honey on his bread. His parents looked at him and said, Billy. Billy looked regretless towards the camera and a circular cutout ends the story. You could look at it that way and then it feels a lot less disappointing. I guess in my perspective at least. A high definition remake was in the works by a fan community and was leaked just about a year ago in an unfinished state. There's been word about the project coming back into fruition but I have yet to be convinced of any real progress that's being made. As per what was released, it's a decent reimagining of the game so long as you consider a lot of the original elements are missing and as per being a non-public early release. I like a few of the ideas present, but there was also a lot which confused me. I think my biggest issue with this mod is that the game doesn't translate well to PC if you don't take into account all the original ideas present in the console release. The combo system, as I went on about earlier, I feel is practically mandatory to tie in with the gameplay, and without it, there's a real lack of motivation. The game was designed for speed. When you consider that, even Sam's walking speed is dramatically slower than in the next encounter. With that, you'll end up coming across a lot of potential issues when porting this game. Being a mod, players probably wouldn't keep it installed for too long if you change up the entire game game's statistical properties, which for the most part you'd need to address to make it a true HD port of the game. So that brings us to the end of this video. In the future we'll be taking a look into comparing the GameCube and PlayStation 2 versions of the game. There were some good fixes, and there were some likely regrettable circumstances. I'll catch you when that comes out. But that's all folks, and I'll see all you frame raiders in the next video.